Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm noticing that the participants are rapidly increasing right around 8.05 now. Uh, so you figured out our uh, plan to delay by five minutes. And of course, everybody uh, signs that at 8.05 now. So welcome, welcome to week eight, uh, Tuesday's keynote uh, presentation. Uh, so this week, uh, as advertised, is about the prospect for new observations over the full electromagnetic spectrum to transform our view of the CGM over the next decade. Um, I just want to point out that you are invited and encouraged to join this week's dedicated Slack channel for discussions and more. I'll give you another word about that in a moment. Uh, this week's Slack channel is Halo 21-Week 8 Future OBS. If you are new to Slack, newly joining us this week, just browse the channels in Slack and head on down to Halo 21. Anybody can join, and that's where the bulk of the discussion is going to take place today. Today's beautiful graphic is the Makani Galaxy from Rootkey et al. 2019, uh, which is data taken with KCWI, which of course our keynote speaker built, so it's thematic. Uh, this galaxy has a spectacular wind you can see here in O2 emission, which spans 80 by 100 kiloparsecs. Uh, totally amazing and stunning. So love this graphic. All right, before we dive in, a few announcements. Uh, as our participant number is rapidly still increasing. Uh, today is Zoom picture day. Wow, I hope everybody did their hair. Um, so uh, after we break after uh, Chris's keynote, so Chris's keynote will end sometime around nine, uh, we'll break for five minutes, come back, take a group picture, and then dive right into the discussion. Uh, this is a little experimental, but we'll try to put it together in a collage that includes everybody. Um, okay, so uh, another announcement is to join the Halo 21 Legacy channel um, if you're interested in various options that we're floating around for how to uh, extend the impact of this conference beyond this week. Uh, and uh, finally, on Thursday at 4.30 Pacific time, uh, we are going to be hosting a social hour on a platform called Room. Are you any? It's where all the cool kids are hanging out these days. Um, it doesn't involve installing any software. It's basically unstructured uh, video chat. Uh, bring a drink, bring a coffee, bring uh, you know some wine, some beer, whatever you want. Uh, it allows for spontaneous breakout rooms to occur, um, and uh, it all happens in your browser. Check out Halo 21 Socializing uh, for details, including the link to the room. All right, and I just want to highlight that the new results are still pouring in, uh, now featured on our YouTube channel, The Fundamentals of Gaseous Halos. Um, the new results have been, I think, one of the most successful aspects of this program. We've got now 56 high-quality four-minute videos describing new results. Um, and uh, and so this week, new this week, Nikki Nielsen has uploaded two uh, new videos recently, uh, as well as Bron Reichard Chu, uh, Sui Zhou, uh, Zhuyue Li, and Roland Sakic. So check those out. Uh, they're not only posted in Halo 21-New Results, but they're also on our YouTube channel, which you can just stream in the evening with your feet up and a beer. It's amazing. Uh, so go check them out. Now, in addition to these new results videos, we've also got some new instruments videos. Uh, and right now, as of this moment, we have two videos, but I believe there are going to be more featured throughout this week, which I'll continue to try to advertise. The two videos that exist right now on the New Instruments playlist on YouTube or in the New Instruments channel uh, are uh, on Arcus by Randall Smith and Blue, Moves, Blue Muse uh, by Johan Ricard. Uh, so uh, check those out if you're interested in some of the new capabilities uh, that are uh, potentially coming online uh, I don't know, someday soon. Learn when, watch the videos. Uh, okay, so let's see. Let's 
slide stopped advancing. This week's featured conversations that we heard from yesterday, HALO 21 and mission, HALO 21 new instruments, and HALO 21 parametric model. I just wanted to let you know that there's a couple after parties scheduled. I haven't heard yet if HALO 21 and mission is scheduling an after party. These are separate Zoom sessions run by the co-initiators, and the Zoom links are in the individual channels. I know that the new instruments channel is having a new instrument roundtable discussion on Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific. Gwen will post the Zoom details in HALO 21 new instruments, if she hasn't already. And HALO 21 parametric model has an after party today at 12 p.m. Pacific. So everybody is welcome to join these after parties. They're just different Zoom links that you have to look out for. All right. And my last comment before I quit blathering is on how I'm going to run the panel discussion. This is my week. I'm the captain now. And I demand that you use emojis. This is the future, everyone. I know emojis might make you uncomfortable. Oh, they're for five-year-olds. But they're what we've got, and they turn out to be a useful tool. So throw your pride away and get on the emoji train. Think of them like hieroglyphics. They're a whole new efficient way to communicate. Somebody's making a comment you like, you can't nod enthusiastically at them, you know, and expect that they're going to see your video. You can't sneer at them when they trash your work. Instead, use an emoji. It's amazing. And what I'm going to do when I run the panel discussion is I'm going to look at the user submitted questions and comments. And the ones that have the most reactions to them are the ones that I'm going to bring to the panel to discuss. So your emoji is kind of is powerful. OK. And the range of reactions available, you can see here is immense, right? You can swear at someone, you can call someone a liar by giving them the Pinocchio emoji, uh, or you can, you know, give them a heart, 100, that's good. Um, anyway, so, uh, so please use emojis. All right, and now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's uh, keynote speaker, Chris Martin. Uh, he has over four decades of experience building space, UV, and ground-based instruments targeted at the dim matter of the CGM and IGM. Uh, of course, he's responsible for bringing GALAX to fruition, I think one of the most successful small explorer programs ever, also Fireball, KCWI, XCWI, and probably has a number of exciting projects in the works, maybe that he'll tell us about today. Uh, after receiving his PhD in 1986 from UC Berkeley, he's authored many, many papers. Fun fact, it's hard to actually figure out exactly how many papers from ADS because uh, he's confused with another uh, giant in the field, Crystal Martin, who happens to be here too on the panel. So between them, they have over a thousand papers, it turns out. Um, and uh, also on the panel uh, is uh, Joe Burchett, Chuck Seidel, and Sarah Tuttle. This is an absolutely incredible panel. Uh, I can't wait for the discussion after the talk, but first up, we have the talk. So I'm going to stop sharing and let Chris take the floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a fantastic conference. Uh, it's too bad it's ending this week, but uh, hopefully we'll have a lot of fun in the last week. Um, so um, there's a huge amount to talk about. I can't talk about everything, so I'm not going to be talking very much about uh, work done by uh, a, a number of my uh, distinguished colleagues, including Chuck, and uh, all the work done by Muse on Lyme and Alpha Halos and QSO Nebulae. Um, but I'm going to try to have a, a more forward-looking picture of what may be possible with this, uh, this technique. So uh, uh, many people are, are, have, have worked with me on, on, on this for a very long time, and uh, I can't individually acknowledge them, but uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a list. So uh, the, the basic structure of this talk is to talk about why do a mission, some new and proposed instruments that will act as a context, what, how we try to extract physical properties, some applications, and I'll, I'll go through those more or less echoing the, the, the themes of the conference, and then very briefly on future missions. So uh, I've been thinking about this for a very long time. This is from a talk I gave <laughs> pre-decadal 2000, recognizing that the IGM and what I call the PGM, the 
pre-galactic medium, is extremely fundamental for understanding how baryons form structure in the universe, uh, and that both emission and absorption would be key to, to tracing these phases of the universe. And I was inspired as a graduate student by this paper by Lyman Spitzer, the idea that the galaxy had a corona was an amazing idea to me. And, uh, you know, many of, it's a beautiful paper if you go back and read it. It's one of those one of, wonderful papers in which uh, there's so much physics, it's, it's, it's a joy to read. Um, so I like to think of it in terms of this paper by Blumenthal et al, which I also was inspiring me as a graduate student. Uh, the formation of structure on the, on, uh, you, you look at overdensity, you look at temperature, velocity, mass, they're all on the same plane. And all of this, and, and, and the dividing line is the cooling time equal to collapse time uh, at solar or zero primordial metallicity. And basically uh, you can put everything on this plane and show where galaxies form and show how the various phases of the, uh, the, the matter that's not in galaxies uh, relates to that in this cosmic dissipation plane. And in particular, halos, which at the time we called the pre-galactic medium, is fundamental a fundamental stage in the formation and, of course, ongoing evolution of galaxies. Why study emission? And, uh, of course, you have to study emission with absorption, uh, and you would like to do it for all the phases, but I'm going to focus on UV optical emission. Uh, and for me, the most important is that you get global quantities like luminosity, uh, hopefully mass, velocity dispersion, size, uh, mass flux. If you can measure, if you can measure it in and out, angular momentum. And by measuring these global quantities, you kind of minimize astrophysical noise. Uh, you get information about density, pressure, temperature, cooling, and collapse time scales, morphology, gas kinematics. And even you can even do large-scale structure mapping. The two big questions are, can we detect it? And we now believe we can, we, we have. And, and can we extract accurate physical parameters? And that's something where it's an ongoing work, I would say. Um, but I want to put it in another term. On an ancient plane, two groups of astronomers worked tirelessly to identify a mysterious object. One group used the exquisitely sensitive measure method of absorption, which allowed them to determine the statistical distribution of various components of the object. Given a large number of objects, they would finally be able to determine what it was. The other group used imaging. So there's a simple reason to, to do imaging, and that is we can recognize what we're seeing more easily, and we can get global information about the objects. Of course, when we're doing a mission, it probably looks more like that. Um, it ten tends to be very faint, and it tends to be hard to detect. But that's why we build instruments dedicated to do it. Uh, an important point about the UV is that it's tracing not just the, the 10 to the 4 degree phase, but all the way up to the 10 to the 6 degree phase. And uh, there's a little bit of ambiguity in the literature, but I'm calling this the cold baryonic halo around 10 to the 4th. And warm baryonic, warm baryonic halo, anything up to 10 to the sixth. Um, and uh, in UV, you can detect with emission lines, in particular the metal lines, all the way up to 10 to the sixth uh, from uh, collisionally ionized, uh, collisionally excited emission. Uh, so here's a comparison by Breton of, of the, the, the relative luminosity in the UV, optical, and X ray. And most of the luminosity comes out in the UV, and that's an important point uh, in, in, in emission. And in particular, at low redshift, um, the halos show, uh, for example, for this simulation shows two, the two components, cold and warm, but warm or warm hot, but the hot component is mostly uh, below uh, 10 to the 6 degrees Kelvin, and that's important because that is observable in the UV, in particular with nitrogen 5 and oxygen six. At low redshift, the UV emission is both much brighter than the optical associated emission and the sky is 100 times fainter. So, so looking in the space UV is extremely useful and powerful in the, uh, at low redshift. 
So the method, methods that we use, of course, are imaging spectroscopy, which is, is, has been developing over the last uh, five years uh, to be a very powerful new tool, uh, in particular with image slicers. And uh, uh, we need to do precision sky subtraction. And uh, we use a technique originally developed by Sembeck and Tonry, not in shuffle, uh, and then, uh, uh, which works extremely well. Uh, and then in the UV, we need very high uh, efficiency detectors, uh, which are being developed uh, at JPL, for example, uh, to get uh, about 10 times the efficiency of the GALAX detectors. So the basic idea is that uh, here we have our beautiful halo cartoon version. We can divide it up into components, image them, measure line profiles, and in particular, uh, when we uh, correct for radio transfer effects, um, we can determine inflow versus outflow, and uh, we can figure out how to measure mass, uh, and I'll talk about that. Uh, and with kinematics plus mass, we can measure mass flux in and out, um, hopefully with empirical parameters that allow us to translate uh, luminosity into mass. So the program we have uh, that I've been working with uh, at Caltech with many collaborators uh, is trying to span the entire wave wavelength range uh, from the epoch of reionization with the red channel, K sub VI, uh, through the blue channel down to redshift of two for Lyman alpha uh, in the uh, <coughs> uh, stratospheric uh, balloon payload fireball looks at 0.7 redshift to Lyman alpha uh, and uh, we're proposing uh, uh, an explorer. We would like to do an explorer called Halo, which would do basically a, a UV version of case of UI from Lyman Alpha out to uh, 25 or 2600 angstroms. So the low redshift universe. Um, this all started uh, when three graduate students and a postdoc built uh, the Palomar Cosmic Web Imager, uh, which was first on sky around 10, 2012. And it was really designed to do this very low surface brightness uh, uh, emission from uh, the CGM and the IGM uh, and, uh, and, and do precision sky subtraction using non shuffle. Uh, that led to the uh, Keck Cosmic Imager, which was commissioned, the Blue Channel was commissioned in 2017. And uh, it, it, it adds all the benefits of the Keck telescope uh, uh, with, uh, to. Um, a much more flexible uh, uh, configuration. You have small, medium, and large slicers with a variety of uh, uh, gratings that give you a variety of uh, spectral resolutions. Uh, and again, the non-shuffle capability. This shows the high resolution capability, uh, R of close to 20,000 using the small slicer on a globular cluster. Um, and we're building the uh, Keck Cosmic Reionization map, mapper led by Matt Matichewski, and we're hoping to commission that next year. Um, and in particular, it should go out to almost 11,000 angstroms, which will allow us to probe Lyman Alpha uh, close to the beginning of what we now believe is the epoch of reionization. Uh, it is uh, always useful to compare case of and Muse. Muse got on the sky first. Uh, we have a broader band pass, but of course, Blue Muse is, 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 has, has been proposed and I'm sure will be built. Uh, so there's a constant competition between th these two great instruments. Uh, there, there we are. Uh, and uh, I hope that we will be able to put an IFU on WFOS on TMT. Uh, the important point about that is that we'll have roughly the same field of view as KSWI with uh, obviously nine times the collecting area, and it will be incredibly powerful, uh, nine times faster uh, than KCBI, and it'll truly be able to map not the, not just CGM, but IGM uh, down to faint levels. So the fireball balloon uh, it, it, it is, uh, has been uh, various configurations. It started out as an integral field spectrograph, uh, it is now a multi-object spectrograph designed to look at uh, halos of uh, galaxies at redshift 0.7. There's a huge cast of uh, participants uh, with major leadership uh, from France, uh, Columbia University, uh, 
JPL, University of Arizona now, uh, in particular, uh, Kerry Holdley uh, and Erica Hamden have been major leaders of this. It flew, uh, 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 this is some, some of the science, the first wide field multi-object UV imaging spectroscopy with imaging constraints on Lyman alpha emission and CGM, uh, and a technology demonstration of these high efficiency detectors uh, and the wide field uh, UV imaging spectrometer. It flew in 2018. Uh, uh, the balloon had a hole in it and we had to fly during the full moon. So we, it was an engineering test, but we got all the objects in the slits and uh, we we're very optimistic about the next flight uh, working extremely well and be able to detect uh, halos at a ratio of 0.7. Uh, uh, what, what, uh, our, our, our true hope is a explorer um, called HALO, the Galaxy HALO Coevolution Explorer. The basic idea is to do something like KCWI only in the, uh, in the space UV from 1200 out to 2500 angstroms. Uh, and the number one goal would be to decode Lyman alpha to actually use multi-wavelength corollary surveys of nearby galaxies to understand the relationship between Lyman alpha and the strong UV emission lines and physical parameters, and then use that to study galaxy halo coevolution, and of course explore the extended low surface bright brightness of the universe. So there'll be more of that uh, as as my talk goes along. Uh, how do we extract physical pro properties? Uh, I like to think of it in terms of three levels of inference: empirical tests, con like controlled experiments, or looking for sc empirical scaling relationships. Uh, model building, <laughs> uh, that's me and a graduate student, and here's a, here's a model. And then what I call uh, bridge building between observations and simulations. And I'll give you an example of that as well. <laughs> so in the first category, I, I like to think that there will be, because halos are relatively simple physical systems, that there will be scaling laws, just like we have for much more complicated systems called galaxies if only because there are conservation laws which apply to both systems. And some analogies would be mass to light ratios uh, that have uh, scaling relationships, something like a Tully-Fisher relation, dark halo mass versus uh, velocity dispersion and, and size, uh, something like a fundamental plane maybe, something like a schmidt kennicutt law. Uh, it's already been demonstrated that there are scaling laws between outflow velocity and specific uh, star formation rate and so on. So this is aspirational, but I believe that this should be possible. I mean, that these may exist. Here's an example. Uh, Donald O'Sullivan did this amazing survey using both Palomar and a Keck uh, of a, a number of QSO nebulae. And one of the things we found, this is just the images of them. And one of the things we found is that uh, there's a scaling relationship between the velocity dispersion uh, the, the size and the source luminosity of objects around these quasars. Um, and you can show that uh, you, just using the virial theorem again, uh, if, you, if the mass to light ratio goes as Lyman alpha luminosity to the alpha pop, uh, then, then the, the luminosity would go as uh, this power uh, of, of the velocity dispersion and radius, and the fit gives you uh, consistent with alpha uh, of 0.27, so mass to luminosity ratio, a weak function of luminosity. And if you look at the TNG's beautiful paper, Viral et al., the TNG simulation of Lyman alpha halos, and the scale, the, uh, for example, the, the 50 kiloparsec surface brightness, in fact, the overall luminosity, uh, it has a similar kind of scaling relationship with mass to light ratio. So that, uh, that suggests we're on to something, perhaps. Uh, model building. Uh, you really need a combination of some simple geometrical models, uh, uh, radiative transfer solutions, and of course, cloudy. Uh, and uh, combining this with absorption and, uh, and other information uh, as, as available, you can hopefully derive mass, density, Filling factor, 
temperature uh, and ionization from line ratios and use kinematic maps to uh, constrain mass fluxes and other uh, kinematic properties. In particular, when you have externally illuminated uh, uh, gas in a quasar illuminated system, for example, uh, the radio transfer works out quite well as long as you're dealing with relatively simple systems like uh, extended rotating structures, as we've been calling them, uh, where the, the velocity map measure from lemon alpha is comparable to the velocity in the gas. <laughs> Here's an example. This is a case where the lemon alpha is, is from the emissivity in the torus. It's a simple torus uh, showing uh, uh, that you can, if you measure the actual velocity, uh, just the velocity mean. You can also measure higher moments, dispersion, skew, kurtosis, et cetera. Uh, but uh, here's a case where you can measure the rotation, velocity, and you can measure the presence of inflow. There's the, the usual sort of distortion of the, the, the spider diagram for rotation, uh, and that that's, allows you to measure uh, some simple parameters. Uh, to go to the next level, uh, I think about uh, Numerical simulations uh, versus observations with 3D emission cubes. Uh, there's an enormous amount of information in both, uh, but it's, it's, it's puzzling to try to bridge this gap. So uh, I've been thinking about this a lot. Um, ideally, we would have a huge number of um, realizations of numerical simulations. And we do in some sense because we have a lot of objects and we have uh, many epochs. Um, but ideally, we would vary the physics. Uh, we have our uh, emission line data cubes. Um, and uh, we want to forward model the simulations into the instrument. So these are case of UI simulations, forward modeled, and then use some sort of bridge modeling uh, to connect these two. And I'll give you an example where we use a toy model. And I think it's possible to use also physical models and even machine learning to determine <clears throat> what we can actually extract from these uh, forward modeled uh, simulations. So now I'm going to give you a few applications. I'm going to follow the course of the, uh, this fantastic uh, workshop, uh, just touch upon each of these as, as possible examples, um, by no means comprehensive or definitive. So halo mass. Uh, I love to think about the halos impact with this uh, beautiful, uh, simple analytic model from Dave and Ben uh, back in 2012. Uh, here's the IGM. Gas is always accreting. Um, and somehow, some of it's forming stars, but most of it isn't. And so the halo is acting as a, as a giant filtering machine. And there are various filtering processes underway. Uh, they distinguish gravity that's virialized uh, realization of the gas, photoionization for low mass halos, uh, quenching some mysterious process, probably black holes, uh, and the interaction of the wind from the galaxy and the CGM. As processes which, which prevent the, uh, the flow of baryons from the IGM to the galaxy. Uh, and I've indicated here colors giving the different phases, cold, cold baryonic, warm baryonic, and hot baryonic. So uh, if we can survey the entire, what I call, galaxy HR diagram, uh, and a halo would be able to do this at low redshift, specific star, star formation rate versus stellar mass, um, uh, and, and look at different uh, stages of uh, galaxy evolution, main sequence, green valley transition galaxies, and red sequence. Um, uh, the, from, from that picture that I showed you before, the Dave picture, uh, you can imagine the mass dependence, uh, the dominant processes, the low mass winds, medium gravity, and high mass quench. And one might expect that the ratio uh, CBH to WBH would be low, high, and low in the three cases, and that the, ma the mass flux uh, in the cold or warm would be uh, pre preferentially out in and out or low in this case. Um, this is notional. Uh, me, uh, also measuring halo mass. Is it possible if we have this extended gas to actually measure 
halo masses kinematically. Well, we did that with uh, the PC, the flashes survey, O'Donnell in, in the paper published last year. Uh, and we got a result which was consistent with what we expect for the quasars uh, hosted by halos of roughly 10 to 12.5 solar masses. So uh, uh, that's, that's encouraging that you actually can, in spite of radio transfer and all the other issues, uh, use the kinematics to explore um, the halo mass. Okay, multiphase. Uh, uh, I want to make a point here that um, we can detect all the way up to 10 to the 6. This shows various lines. This is 06, for example, uh, as a fun in a collision ionized halo, uh, uh, relatively low mass in, in the baryons, in the warm phase, uh, but it is detectable uh, in the UV by a, by a mission like HALO. Um, and uh, both, both O6 and nitrogen 5, uh, all the way out to 10 to the 6. Um, and, uh, uh, of course, it's uh, a mission uh, at a lower temperature is detectable uh, with, uh, with different lines, um, carbon-4 in particular, carbon-3, uh, and line ratios allow you to extract both metallicity and the temperature of this phase, this multiphase gas, uh, or determine whether it's a temperature distribution. An example of that, in terms of ionization, this is a paper that hopefully will come out in the next couple of months. Uh, a, a quasar Z of 2.5, where we detect an outflow with multiple lines. Uh, and uh, this is the radial uh, integration of the spectrum showing a certain large number of lines. Uh, and when you try to fit that to uh, ionization parameters, uh, you really have to have a distribution of ionization parameters. Um, and this shows you the, the fit is, is the line and the ob observation, the observed line ratios are the dots. Um, and this shows the distribution of ionization parameter you get and the distribution of associated filling factors that come from that fit. So by combining various line ratios, you get, a, you get constraints on the distribution of both ionization and filling factor, uh, i.e. density. Uh, Non-thermal components. Well, I think uh, it's very clear. If you just look at this picture from um, G et al, uh, that you're going to see something different in emission uh, if there are cosmic rays or not. Uh, and uh, if the picture doesn't convince you, uh, the, the distribution of temperature and, and density is hugely different and, in particular, very impactful on the emission uh, from these halos. So. Uh, this is an important constraint that will come from emission observations. The Milky Way. Well, this is where I started many years ago, and with the um, inspiration of Stu Boyer, who passed away last year due to COVID-related illness, um, we flew this experiment on the space shuttle that detected from the uh, Milky Way halo carbon-4 emission. and. Uh, uh, since then, uh, FUSE has seen O6 emission uh, in many areas of the halo. And uh, however, there has not been a lot of uh, analysis of, of these. There's also the SPEAR experiment, which detected many lines. Um, and uh, I think this all relates back to Joel's original paper another inspiration for me on the galactic fountain um, and, and the transformation of gas from uh, perhaps condensing out of a hot halo into, into intermediate temperature phases and condensing on, onto the Milky Way. Uh, okay, uh, outflows. Uh, I, I showed the radial spectrum uh, uh, and the multi-ionized, the multi uh, component ionization spectrum of this QSO outflow. Here are some images. We see it in Lyman alpha, helium, nitrogen five, carbon four. Here are the line profiles. Um, and uh, we can show that uh, radio transfer um, allows you to uh, measure line moment, velocity moments quite accurately. And one of the most amazing things about it, it's, it's, it's a very 
clear bi biconal outflow, uh, uh, which fits it quite well, but you can, in fact, with this case of UI data, fit, uh, show that there has to be rotation in the outflow. So this is kind of a surprise. It's the kind of thing you get out of imaging uh, that, in fact, you have rotating gas in an outflow. That means that angular momentum is actually being ejected by this outflow, which is surprising. And this shows the velocity map and the, the velocity model. It shows this uh, behavior. This is an amazing paper that uh, Jess just referred to, the Makani win starburst merger um, a giant uh, bubble outflow from uh, with a diameter of 100 kiloparsecs. Amazing, amazing object with, taken with case of UI. And again, they extract a large number, not only a large number of physical parameters, but they can isolate two outflow episodes, which I think is going to be something that we're going to see more and more, that there are multiple starburst uh, 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 episodes that can be detected in the mission. Uh, of course, this uh, papers on Lyman Alpha Halos from uh, Chuck and Don Erb, and, and, and uh, they're working very hard to demonstrate, uh, to figure out what's going on in these uh, star-forming galaxies um, at high redshift. And there's a huge amount of information in the Lyman Alpha profile. Some people say it's radio transfer, it's Lyman Alpha, how can you figure it out? I say it's an opportunity because uh, it actually gives you information that you don't get if you have optically thin uh, emission. So uh, we can we can we can actually ex exploit this to learn more about um, the actual uh, kinematic morphology of the systems and physical origins. Uh, this was a uh, an observation by KCWI. I'm sorry, PCWI, the Palomar Cosmic Imager, of uh, what. Sebastian Cantalupo calls the slug nebula. We found that it had this very clear shear. We called it a protogalactic disk. We had this discussion in one of the previous weeks that it's not really a disk. We're trying to come up with a new name like extended accreting rotating structure. Um, so here's a case where we use bridge modeling to, to figure out what this is. This is uh, the Vela model. Um, from Deckel and Severino showing, uh, for example, the velocity distribution in this inflowing gas, um, inflowing and rotating, but it's obviously complex. How do you compare this to observations? Um, well, first of all, you get better data, and this shows what happens when you go from P sub UI to K sub UI. So just think about going from K sub UI to IFOS. Um, but when I first saw that, I said, well, this is this, how could we possibly fit this? Um, so this is what we do. We, we first take a simulation, do forward modeling, and use something called, we call the multi-filament inflow model. So it's just a, a successive increase in number of parameters where you have a linear radial flow, you have a single uh, mode of inflow or outflow. So it's an azimuthally modulated uh, radial flow with either sign, with one mode, just like a sign mode, two modes, three modes, and so on. And then you calculate the uh, Akiki uh, information criteria for that and see when it falls. And when it falls to uh, a low number, you know you've, you've actually perhaps measured something. So here's a case where by going from pure rotation to rotation plus one mode of MFI inflow, you, the AIC goes down by a huge amount. That's the simulation run through forward model uh, case of UI. And then this is one of our galaxies near quasar illuminated uh, galaxies. And again, you see the same thing. Here's, here's the MFI four and the data. Here's the second, the slug nebula. Uh, simple rotation, MFI4, and the data. So it works quite well. This is a less massive system. It requires fewer modes. This is a more massive system, requires more modes, uh, but it's extremely significant and shows, and the fact that it happens with the simulation as well tends to show that these, we might be seeing the same thing in both the simulations and the, and the observations. And when you do that, you can actually calculate 
masses, mass fluxes, and so on in the system, the mass flux you get uh, is, is comparable to that of the star formation of the central galaxy in both cases. So that's encouraging. Okay, angular momentum. Uh, this is something you can measure with a mission. Uh, projected angular momentum in the plane of the sky. Uh, you can look at just simple object shear, the same objects I showed you before, quasar illuminated uh, uh, some sort of gas cloud. Uh, this is the distribution of shear, and we do find we went in search for other objects like these uh, uh, extended rotating structures, and we found uh, a distribution of shears, but there are uh, an, of order of 20 sources that have very high shear. Um, you can measure the uh, angular momentum parameter uh, of the gas, and this is the distribution you get, and this is the log normal uh, halo lambda uh, distribution for halos, uh, angular momentum. Uh, and uh, it seems to, seem to fit. There may even be some, what I call spin orbit coupling, the sources, you can compare the source angular momentum to the angular momentum of the whole system. Uh, and there seems to be uh, an excess of sources that have their angular momentum either aligned or anti-aligned with that of the uh, overall system. Uh, and uh, the fact that they could be anti-aligned could just be the orientation ambiguity. So that's, that's an interesting out, out, out possibility that you can only get from imaging. Okay, uh, redshift dependence. This is, I like to think of all these kinds of observations as controlled experiments where we vary one parameter, uh, halo mass, star formation rate. Uh, redshift, okay, so um, this, is a, this is a huge variation. Everything changes, at low and high redshift. Galaxy size, star formation rate, specific star formation rate, angular momentum, quenching, halo size, halo density, filament size with respect to halo, um, galaxies hosting quasars, etc. Uh, here is a prediction for the CGM at low redshift in, in H alpha mission uh, by Lockhurst. They're trying to observe it with the uh, with the uh, uh, dragonfly narrowband version. Uh, and we've been doing some observations uh, uh, with case and BY to try to detect uh, H alpha since we don't have a UV satellite yet. Uh, this has been led by Zarin Lin. Uh, and here's a case where we're observing um, a fairly bright, uh, massive galaxy with a high star formation rate. And uh, this shows that we're seeing uh, a mission. Uh, it's noisy. But in fact, there's a, there appears to be a large enhancement at a very, at greater than 100 kiloparsecs, which is uh, quite amazing. And the overall mission levels are comparable to those seen by Lockhorst. Um, uh, and uh, the velocity uh, components, for example, the velocity dispersion seems to be rising in this uh, outer um, enhancement. Very interesting observation. Hopefully, this will be published in the next couple months. And I just want to show the halo field of view again compared to that. With KCBI, of course, we have to mosaic this to get out to even partial away for a virial radius. Uh, with the halo field of view, um, we get a lot more all at once. Uh, so um, galaxy halo co uh, evolution. And the halo mission, as I said, the first goal is to basically learn how to extract physical parameters from Lyman alpha and the other uh, strong UV lines. Um, and then uh, by surveying uh, galaxies over the galaxy HR diagram, uh, make connections between the halo properties and the galaxy properties in order to probe galaxy halo coevolution. So there'd be multiple surveys. A reference survey would do basically goal one, looking at, for example, all the cost uh, galaxies. Um, looking at black holes, both uh, active and um, non-active. Uh, uh, so this is my mental picture. Here's the galaxy HR diagram, and we get a large number of galaxies 
spanning uh, all these parameters. And uh, we correlate those with the, the halo properties that we measure in emission. Uh, and uh, in terms of cartoons, the goal would be to try to explain the baryon conversion efficiency curve, uh, the uh, equilibrium that's occurring on the star forming main sequence, uh, which uh, may be some sort of uh, balance between inflows, outflows, and star formation in the galaxy, uh, show that the mass metallicity relation is is connected to um, outflows uh, and try to show that how the CGM is responsible, uh, the, the distribution of cold gas that can be accreted is responsible for the uh, fall in the cosmic star formation rate. And uh, so in terms of observables and conversion factors, we do the reference survey to measure these empirical conversion factors, and some, of course, will be functions, uh, uh, and then hopefully uh, measure um, cold baryonic halo mass, uh, both inflow and outflow mass, and mass flux, angular momentum, dark halo mass, and warm baryonic halo mass over this uh, HR diagram uh, with the enough galaxies uh, in each region to make a statistically significant uh, measurement. Uh, here's an example of, of how this was done. Uh, here's an affluent galaxy above the main sequence uh, with this beautiful mag magnesium-2 emission, uh, and Bertrand et al. Um, did this beautiful conversion of the uh, uh, optically thick emission into physical parameters showing a large outflow flux. Uh, in this, in this, what looks like an isotropic outflow with KCBI. And uh, this, you may, may even be able to see this post, uh, post wind, post the star forming episode. This is a case uh, where there's uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps a quenching galaxy, B e plus A galaxy, uh, showing what looks like a relic, relic wind. Um, okay, finally, I think it's very important. I've added a few topics uh, that we could have done if we had more, more weeks in this co conference. I think the CGM-IGM connection is extremely important. And uh, all I can say about this is here's this beautiful picture from the illustrious simulation, the paper by Byrol, showing the Lyman alpha and emission and showing, in fact, you can see the connection of these halos with the filaments of the cosmic web. Uh, OK, uh, what's the future? Uh, I promise that I will retire after all of these fly. Uh, uh, of course, we heard about ASPRA. Looks like a great mission to look at 06 and nearby galaxies. Uh, we would like to do an integral field uh, mid-X halo, but we might uh, also be able to do a long duration balloon that does it just at 0.7. Uh, if the decayal survey decides we need probes, then I would propose a probe which has both integral field spectroscopy and multi-object spectroscopy over the UV, and uh, of course, in the future. And of course, there are many other ideas as well. There may be an 8 to 16 meter UV optical uh, telescope, but that's not going to be uh, in the next 10 years, I can say that, maybe not even the next 20. At high redshift, Redshift, of course, we're about to have a fully uh, equipped uh, case of UI with the red and blue channel. Um, and HETEX is under construction or almost commissioned, I'm not sure. Uh, blue Muse plus blue Muse would be extremely powerful. Uh, I don't know what the status is, but uh, I, I imagine it's going to be funded. I would like to see an IFOS on WFOS. Uh, I think that's going to be extremely powerful. And one can imagine a uh, dedicated um, wide field uh, optical integral field spectrograph with ultra large field of view and precision sky subtraction. So uh, a mission like HALO needs broad community support. 
and would be a perfect complement to an X-ray mission like Arcus. So this is the community that would be interested scientifically. And uh, I think it's important to remember this when you talk to your grandmother or funding uh, funding people, NASA people, like in the elevator, you have 10 seconds to make a case. Most of the matter of the universe is in halos. And maybe most of the action uh, determining galaxy evolution is in halos as well. And we've been spending a lot of time doing galaxies, uh, but uh, as this conference has pointed out, the, the potential for uh, understanding what's going on with galaxies uh, and structure formation in, in, by studying halos is incredibly uh, powerful. If you do an ADS search for galaxy plus evolution, you get 56,000 papers, 3 million citations. So uh, I think that I'm preaching to the choir, but I, it's time to try something new. And there's, there's a hope that halos are the deus ex machina of galaxies which is a plot device whereby a seemingly unsolvable problem in a story is suddenly and abruptly resolved by an unexpected and unlikely occurrence, bringing the tale to a happy ending. Maybe that will be the case. Um, and I just want to end by thanking the, everyone who participated in this conference uh, and thanking the organizers for inviting me and for their incredible work. I think they're, they're an amazing group, and I think they deserve halos. So, thank you. Sounds like we all deserve halo. Uh, okay, so thank you so much, Chris. That was uh, a great talk, inspirational. I think um, a lot of us are now filled with ideas for the future. Um, how about we hold on to those ideas? Let's come back at 9.05 for our picture, where then we will go right into the panel discussion. But until 9.05, so that's eight minutes from now, you know, do your hair, make sure you look good. Um, and then also head on to the Slack, ask questions, react to the questions that are already there using your emojis. And, uh, and yeah, we'll see you at 9.05 Pacific time. So five after the hour uh, when we'll take a photo and then we'll head right into the discussion. Thanks again, Chris, for a great talk.